Mark Padden touched the sky on June the 5th and 6th, 2021. Two years after winning some small-town races after a promising under-23 cycling career, the Ukrainian was back to win a World Tour race, the Criterium Dauphiné, with the Martian Bahrain Victorious, a team where Damiano Caruso finished second in the Giro d'Italia, and Sonny Colbrelli achieved what he had never come close to achieving in his professional career by winning stage races in the European Championship and Paris-Roubaix before almost dying on the bike in the middle of the competition. Remember how Padon hilariously took his first and last two World Tour victories in that Dauphiné? The Ukrainian rider arrived at those two high mountain days more than half an hour behind Alexei Lutsenko, the leader in GC. According to him, he had been feeling very sick, having gone straight from a high altitude training camp after two months on a protein diet to lose weight at sea level to competition nutrition. But suddenly, on one of the hardest passes in the Alps, La Plagne, he started to feel better, like the doper Stephen Roach when he began to cut seconds off Probenicid Delgado like an animal on that pass in the summer of 1987. And suddenly, faced with the attack of favourites well positioned in the GC like Richie Porte or Sepp Kuss, the young Padon was not only able to follow their wheel, but he got in front of them all of them, and sitting down without making a single attack, he left one after the other. All his rivals gapped until he was left alone, just as Ventolin Big Mig did in 1995, also on this peculiar climb. The best of all is that Padan himself declared that he did it only so that his mother could see him on television. <laughs> Laughable statement for a man with hair on his balls. This maternal dependence is both endearing and, well, rather pathetic. If it had all stayed there, possibly no one would remember this cyclist. But, perhaps blaming his Catholic thoughts, he said, For what I have left in this convent, I'll shit in it. And so he decided to double the bet for the next day. Padan, not caring what anyone would say, decided to break away with two other good climbers like Guillaume Martin and Patrick Conrad, and they did so from almost the beginning of the stage. But number 127 decided to let them go 27 kilometers from the finish, 6 kilometers from the top of the Col de la Colombière, and again sitting down for sheer power in the face of the impotence of his fellow escapees. It was no stage given away. The bunch was accelerating for one of the favourites to try to win on a mountain as prestigious as the Juplan, but Padan was in a trance. It was no longer his mother who was encouraging him to continue. It was Jesus Christ himself who had appeared to him, and, just as he did with those loaves and fishes, he began multiplying the watts of power with which our devout, believing friend was climbing, climbing like the drug addict Marco Pantani in 1997 on that same alpine colossus. In fact, no one in the peloton could even cut a second off Padon during the whole climb, even though he'd been in the escape for more than a hundred kilometers. And we're not talking about mediocre riders, far from it. The second rider to finish that day was the very same little dictator Vingegaard, who would finish second in the Tour de France just a month later. Padan started making strange gestures to the cameras, celebrating the victory in such a comical and sad way that it generated a feeling around the world that what he had done was not the result of hard training and healthy nutrition. In fact, the next day in Le Parisien, the sports director of a French team literally said that Padan's two victories were not normal, that they were disgusting. Harsh words. Harsh words indeed that dented the Bahrain team who, despite publicly defending their rider, decided not to include him in the Tour de France roster, and where they flew with Mohoric and Dylan Turns, taking three stage victories, each one more incredible than the last. This exclusion from the Tour was the beginning of the end for the Ukrainian guinea pig. The same day that Melan Erzen informed the Ukrainian mystic that he would not be going to the Grand Boucle 2021, Padan decided to send everything to hell. He had sacrificed himself by pushing his body to unsuspected limits. He was in the bookmaker's top ten favourites to win the yellow jersey. And on top of that, he was called when he was doing a 200 kilometer session. And then the Holy Spirit appeared to him, and lo, told him thus in a loud voice, Mark, even if you have a one-year contract, start looking for a team.
And not only did he do it, he started to anxiously eat pizzas and cakes and chocolates and sweets like the bitter Bridget Jones when she was rejected at her job. He was throwing away the stealth preparation that the Bahrain team had prepared for him. Padan didn't understand. He really thought that God, the Father himself, had given him such a great talent, so superior that other people couldn't, wouldn't believe it. It seemed that the spirit of Erden Senna had entered Mark Padan, as if the Brazilian had ascended to the sky of Imola and was waiting for the arrival of the Ukrainian in Vicenza, where he lives with his doped compatriot Sergei Gonchar, of course. That's when he's not living in Andorra to pay less tax. Despite the fact that this compulsive liar claims not to be a capitalist because of his Christian faith. He never returned to the level shown in the Dauphiné in 2021, despite competing in the Vuelta a España. But still, a hipster took the bait to hire him the following year. The legendary doper, hypocrite and writer, Jonathan Vorters. We shouldn't be too surprised either. Lance Armstrong used Vorters like Bart Simpson used Milhouse Van Houten. Sometimes you think how someone so smart could be so gullible. He suddenly bought the story that Padon was a cyclist with a huge VO2 max, the highest he had ever seen in his life after some tests in Tuscany. Padon's agent sent him the corresponding biological passport files and saw that he hadn't doped and that Mark had suddenly broken all the mathematical models of the Bahrain team's performance director in that Dauphiné. The same day he signed him to a three-season contract for a generous amount of money, Vortus had bitten, and Padan began to laugh at the gringos. In his first race, he scored his first, last and only victory with Education First, a time trial in Ezekiel Mosquera's Galician's village race. And coincidentally, this is the only time trial that he's ever won. The war between Russians and Ukrainians had just broken out, and Padan didn't hesitate to fly the blue and yellow flag. The perfect excuse to justify performance drops and massive junk food intakes, getting fat like Hansel in the Wicked Witch's house. Padon's parents, whom he loves so much, live in Seattle, but he is too affected by the war and of course he's thinking about the Donbass and not the European mountain passes where he is paid to work. The Ukrainian had the nerve to say that for him, eating like a professional cyclist bores him that it's a job and not a healthy way to live. And so he continued to put on weights, being already an education-first mascot to defend the Ukrainian cause as Joe Biden's follower Vortas likes to do. And then he started collecting DNFs, and then DNSs, in every competition. And Vortas ended up kicking him off the team before he'd even finished his contract. Only a desperate team like Coratec Vini Fantini, the same one that wanted to sign Narito Quintana when he was already marked by the Tramadol case, will they have taken on Padan. And he's delighted to return to Italy with his greasy pizza ristorante at Gonchar's place. Well, so far in two competitions, he has a DNF in La Guelia and a DNS in Terreno Adriatico, where he finished last in several stages. Yes, behind even Chris Froome. Padan is 27 years old, and he is still saying that his victories in the Dauphiné were not a miracle. Yes, we believe it wasn't the work of God either. We believe it was the work and grace of chemical advances.